So, Dr. Bruce, welcome to The Lion Within Us. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great, Chris. It's an honor to be with you guys. Oh, it's, 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 it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm really looking forward to this time with you. And, and I'm curious, I always like to find out before we dive into the meat of, of, of the topic we're going to be talking about, what's something fun about you, uh, Bruce, that you like to share with others that maybe not everyone knows about, about you or your personality? <laughs> well, I got a weird sense of humor part of that. That's, that's it. And it gets me in trouble sometimes. But uh, I guess um, – and I'm a huge, avid University of Kentucky basketball fan, so uh, I just do crazy stuff to try to watch the game. I was actually teaching this in teaching our message in Romania uh, in, in 2014 when they were in the Final Four and the championship game. And so I'm up at 4 a.m. in the morning having taught Friday, Saturday, all day long. So it's Sunday morning at 4 o'clock, which is the game plays there. It's 8 o'clock here. And I got three church churches I'm speaking at that day, and I'm still up watching the game. So I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit, uh, uh, I might need some help on that. I don't know. <laughs> hey, well, I mean, that, but, that, yeah, at least you're yeah. passionate about it. So what makes you so passionate about Kentucky basketball? I just, that I, mean, I, was, I was, I was born in Texas, but I was raised in Kentucky. And if you live in Kentucky, you're okay. a Kentucky basketball fan, unless you live in Louisville. Yeah. And then some of those are, 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 are Kentucky fans too. So it's just, you know. Uh, it's, it's kind of a religion <laughs> of the state. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's blue. It's, and it's my, it's my, it's it's my hobby. It's what I mean. My, it just keeps me, yeah. March madness is fun. So this year, not so it much. Is but fun. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It is fun. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. I mean, I'm excited to, to meet with you and to be able to unpack this message today because I read your book and, one area that and I know so many Christian men struggle with, including me, is is the idea of forgiveness. So I'm just maybe high level overview get us going you know, of what forgiving forward is is just all about. Well, our heart and our passion is to help people experience the freedom of the gospel through the power of forgiveness. Uh, and so, what we exist to do is to teach people how to forgive and how to help other people forgive, because most people who need to forgive need help. Uh, and we have discovered through our own experience and. Uh, hard, tough lessons, uh, that there's a severe consequence when we don't forgive. And uh, it, in the only way we get free of that consequence is because is when we choose to forgive. Uh, there's a whole lot behind that we'll unpack as we go on. But uh, that's kind of the overview. Uh, when people don't forgive, they are, they're tormented. And the, tormented on, only, the torment only leaves when we choose to forgive. Amen to that. I mean, I, I know... Early in your book, when I was reading, it was talking about bitterness, and I man, it just resonated with me. I was like, "Oh man, this is a, this is a good one," because he actually says bitterness is like drinking a poison, and hoping someone else dies. I was like, "Man, that that right there, yeah, never heard." It, it really is, and I mean, I I I, I got that quote from R.T. Kendall, and I don't know who he got it from, but uh, the it it really is. It's like you know, taking fire into your lap. Uh, but I, but we have found that forgiveness is the medicine we administer to someone else that gives us life. So it, unforgiveness destroys us. Forgiveness frees us. It's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. Although there's a lot to it, but it's very simple. Oh, for sure. I mean, maybe pull up that bitterness a little bit more, particularly for the guys, because I know a lot of guys that I talk to, even part of our line within this community. You know, they deal with this bitterness. Bitterness is something that we all struggle with. So, I mean, what, you know, why do you think so many of us, particularly men, you know, battle this, 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 I guess, spirit of, of, of bitterness that's out there? Well, I think there's a lot, there, there's a lot behind that. But to specifically answer your question, then there's a better, a, a bigger answer to the question. But, but we get wounded. Somebody does something to us and we think they need to pay. And we believe that someone has done something that is that is lessened us. It has hurt us. It has devalued us. There's there, there's some debt, uh, some uh, a wound that that lessens us, and so we get bitter, and so we begin to focus on that, and focus on that, and focus on that. And so there's there's part of it is us just looking and focusing the wrong direction. But I think it's deeper than that. I think when we don't forgive, there actually is a demonic force that's tormenting us, and we're attract we're attributing it to the wound. We're not attributing it to our unforgiveness. 
Uh, now, I just made a, a, a big statement that is kind of further on in, in, the, in the setup, but it's a big deal when we don't forgive. And, but, but bitterness says they owe me something and they haven't paid it. Uh, they they uh, did something and they need to pay and they're not paying and I'm upset with that. Uh, right. But true forgiveness says the debt's already been paid. That's where we have to get it get to. Right. And I mean that's that's the hard area for a lot of guys to get to for sure. And and I think that's for me, that's the area that I struggle with, you know, where it's just that true forgiveness. Like I may say it, like, yeah, I forgive you, but I don't really. You know, I'm gonna remember, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. remember that. Mm -hmm. I think I, and just being real here, I think that's where a lot of guys probably struggle with. Like, we'll say the words, but it's the difference in actually, you know, walking it out. We salute it, but we don't do it. We Amen. salute it, but we don't do it. And there's no Christian leader or follower of Christ who will tell you that it's that that forgiveness is a bad idea. Uh, but the enemy will get us to to get it so muddy and so diluted that we don't actually do it, even though we say we do. And if we don't, then the torment continues, the bitterness continues. And uh, if it's okay, let me unpack what I mean by torment. Why I say that so strongly. Um, yes, sir. And, and just just our background. I was pastor's son. I got saw saw my dad get wounded. I go into ministry. I get wounded a lot. And there's about a year of my ministry. I mean, horrific things happened to us and our family. One of our children was molested by a church member. I had to be the pastor and the father at the same time. Uh, we were put out without reason, without cause. Uh, nothing legitimate. No actual actionable thing happened. But we just don't want you here anymore. You don't fit anymore. Um, we want somebody else, whatever. And we we get wounded deeply. And so I'm walking through this year of torment, what I would only call torment, because a scab from an old wound got knocked off by a current event. And when uh, when that happens, we get oftentimes confused that it's a current event or the old event, which is it, but we're just a mess. And I'm a, a year, I'm just a mess. And finally, through a good uh, a counselor who's become a dear friend and a lake house that someone loaned to me and a retreat with just me and God, God confronted me on my unforgiveness and I learned to forgive. And I chose to forgive. And then I helped my wife forgive. Then we helped our kids forgive. It completely changed our entire family. And then I helped my dad forgive. And I've started this process of seeing people, when they choose to forgive, get free. So I did some research and did some deep study of what forgiveness actually means in the Bible. And I started seeing some things. Uh, part of it, through my own study, uh, I think Bruce Wilkinson helped me see one key part of it. But there's still this whole development what 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 is forgiveness in scripture actually referred to for us and i noticed something in the lord's prayer that was that i'd read thousands of times i'd quoted thousands of times it's like everybody knows the lord's prayer if you're in america you know the lord's prayer it's like most people know the lord's prayer uh the catholics call it the our fathers right it's 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 this uh model prayer jesus gives us to pray and the one condition in the model prayer is about forgiveness. And it's not the condition we would expect. Because if I was predicting Jesus giving us a conditional prayer about forgiveness in his model prayer, it would be something like this. God, help me forgive others the way you have forgiven me. But it's exactly the opposite of that. Because Jesus says we're to pray essentially this. Heavenly Father, please use the standard that I use in dealing with the people who wound me as a standard you use to relate to me. Well, do we really want God using anything we do as a standard, particularly how we deal with wounds? But that's what Jesus tells us to pray. In fact, it's the only clause in the Lord's Prayer he gives immediate commentary to when he says, if you forgive men their trespasses, your Father will forgive you. If you don't, he won't. Now, we're not talking about eternal security, Chris. That's a whole different question. But what he is saying is this, the way we deal with the people who wound us is how God will relate to us while we're walking around on the planet. And that should be unsettling to us. And multiple times he says it throughout the Gospels. But the most shocking statement he ever makes to me in all the scriptures in Matthew 18, it has to do with forgiveness. Uh, and this is kind of an aha moment or uh-oh moment. You know, this is, oh my, uh, really? 
when I saw this. This was, I mean, 30 years in ministry before I see this. Peter asked Jesus a question. How many times do I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Seven times and up. And, uh, and Peter thought he was doing great because he knew the Pharisees of the day said someone sinned against you twice, had to forgive three times if you want to be generous. But after that, you don't have to, probably shouldn't. So when Peter was saying seven times, he was doubling the maximum of the Pharisees and adding one, saying, did I do good, Jesus? Do I, do I, get, a, do I get a gold star? Do I get a pat on the back? Right. And That's Jesus right. said, how about 70 times seven? That's 490 times. That's an unlimited number when you think about it, isn't it? Because if you get into the 460s and you're still counting, <laughs> you have probably not been forgiving. <laughs> you're not going to keep track that long, will you? And then no. Jesus said something significant. Whenever in the Gospels Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like, you want to pay attention. Because he's giving us a glimpse as to how God wants things to work. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he gives us a story, a parable, a a natural account to teach a supernatural truth. And here's the story. There was a ruler who came to collect debts from some servants who owed him money. Now, now there weren't e online. With, one was not, I mean, one's under the authority of the other. They weren't equal. And he came right. to the first servant and he said, oh, you who owed him 10,000 talents, he says, pay me what you owe me. He goes, I don't have it. And the ruler said, I'm going to throw you and your family into debtor's prison. And the guy goes, please, please, please give me time. I'll pay it back. Now, he didn't ask for forgiveness. He asked for time. I'm going to work this out. But the ruler gave him more than he asked for. He forgave him the debt. Well, it's a great story, but most people I know, I didn't for many years until I did the research. I, you really don't know what a talent is worth. A talent in that day was a, was a, a, a amount of money or a, that was equivalent to 60 mina. And a mina was worth three months' wages. So one talent is 180 months' wages or 15 years' wages for one talent. This guy owed 10,000 of them. That's 150,000 years' worth of wages. Please, please, please give me time. <laughs> Chris, do you have a 150,000 year mortgage on your house? Does anybody in the audience have one? Nobody has one of those. At 50,000 a year, which is a median income in the U.S., that's $7.5 billion with a B that the ruler forgave. Which means the ruler's net worth came down by that much and the net worth of the servant came up by that much. And I'm thinking if I'm the servant, I'm throwing a party. I'm in a good mood. We're celebrating. This guy doesn't do that. He goes and finds another servant, not someone under his authority, someone on line with him under the same ruler's authority who owed him 100 days wages. That's 16 grand. That's a manageable debt. And he says, pay me what you owe me. Same appeal. Please, please, please give me time. I'll pay it back. And the first servant choked the second one and threw him in prison. And the ruler heard about it because, face it, fellow servants will always rat on you. They kind of always, it's just they're going to tell on you. And they, they, were, they, they were distressed by this, right? It says they were grieved. And they told the ruler what happened. And the ruler summoned the first servant and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all of that debt because you asked for mercy. Should you not have also had mercy on your fellow slave the same way I had mercy on you? And I think that's a legitimate question. And then his, it says, and his Lord, little L, moved with anger, rightfully so, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay what he owed. Well, what did he owe at this point in the story? Boy, he didn't owe the money. Because if you forgive a debt, you legally can't reclaim that debt, right? But he owed something. Right. What is it he owed? Should you not have also had mercy in the same way I had mercy on you? He owed mercy to the next guy, or what we call forgiving forward. Mm -hmm. And the torturer in that day was a man who was assigned to the jail who was skilled at exacting the greatest amount of pain for the longest amount of time without someone passing out or dying. Thank you. Braveheart, the guy at the end of the movie. I'm pretty sure all the guys out there have seen that guy at the Braveheart, right? That's the that's what we're talking about. Waterboarding. We all have seen movies. If you ever watch 24, every episode had somebody being tortured. We know what it looks like. Jesus now leaves the parable, which is significant. Why? 
because he's no longer telling a pretend story. He's now addressing Peter's question. And he says, my heavenly father will do the same to you if each of you does not forgive your brother from your heart. Well, the same what? My heavenly father will do the same what? Well, it can't mean anything but hand you over to the torturers. That word torturer is used 18 times in the Greek New Testament. And of the other 17 times, every other time with maybe one exception, it's used in connection with hell or demonic activity. Do you remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Lazarus was the beggar. The rich man wouldn't help him. They both died the same day. Lazarus woke up in heaven in Abraham's bosom, which is a place of comfort. The rich man woke up in hell using the same word, being in torment. Uh -huh. God withholds his protection from us when we don't forgive. He gives legal. This is hard to understand. Something. This, this was shocking to me when I saw this. But he gives legal authority for demonic forces to torment us when we don't forgive. And it's not because we've been wounded. It's because we haven't forgiven the wound. Mm -hmm. And torment looks like bitterness. Looks like anxiety. It looks like depression. It looks like uh, uh, anger out, uh, uncontrolled anger. All of the addictions: alcohol addiction, drug addiction, sex addictions, uh, control issues. Some some physical issues. Chris, we've literally seen people physically healed by choosing to forgive. Now, not all physical issues are unforgiveness related, but if the forgiveness is related, uh, the torment is express itself physically because of the unforgiveness. Well, the moment someone forgives, they get free. One lady was on the heart transplant list. Her heart was at 20% capacity. Tony coached her to forgive. And uh, after it was done, she went back the next week to her checkup. And they said, your heart's now at 90% capacity. We don't know what happened. We're taking you off the list. And she says, I know what happened. I forgave and God healed me. It's, And again, torment is there. Not because something bad happened to us. And it doesn't dismiss what happened to us, but it's there because we haven't forgiven the bad thing that happened to us. Because we've been forgiven a lot ourselves. Uh, one story. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm trying to think. What, hey, real, what, real, real quick, yeah, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Bruce, let's take a quick break and we'll come right back and get to your story. Are you enjoying the weekly spiritual kickoff? If so, we are now offering a way to participate in our live daily spiritual kickoffs that happen Monday through Friday in our community. This is your chance to chat with me directly and other members of our community to dive into scripture and to leave with practical ways to simplify and apply God's word to your daily walk. And here's the best part. You get all of this for just $5 a month. So for what most people pay for a breakfast meal, you can join us on this journey of spiritual growth and leadership, which will always lead you full. Our community is dedicated to supporting each other and pushing forward in our faith. Come join me in the lion's den and become the leader God intends you to be. Sign up now at thelionwithin.us and let's start this journey together. Remember, it's only $5 a month for this amazing opportunity. So visit thelionwithin.us so you don't miss out. All right, Dr. Bruce, we're back here. So you, you had a story. You just were talking about torment, and you had something that you wanted to share. So go ahead. Yeah, we sir. had a well, – there's so many stories we could tell you. We have a 90% breakthrough rate in one session when we coach people or couples. It's crazy what God does. Uh, because if the torment is a part of the tor of forgiveness and uh, unforgiveness, then you forgive, you, you get free. One couple came to us. Uh, he's actually a, 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 an award-winning – a Grammy award-winning R&B uh, musician. And uh, he got, he came to Christ about three weeks before, had an encounter with God. And in that, after that encounter, he confessed to his wife of 14 years. He didn't know how many women he had slept with. He, had, would drive, he would fly women to wherever he was all over the world. And, um, and he had an 11-year-old son his wife knew nothing about. And somehow, somehow, he got her to come with him to us. And, and I'm not even sure how you heard about this, but it was it was a, just a God thing, right? So I began coaching him, and his and, and if, if wounded people wound people often in the way in which they're wounded, 
And if you've got, you've been wounded and you don't deal with it, you'll oftentimes repeat that wounding. And so we begin to evaluate, evaluate that his father had uh, had the same kind of lifestyle. And if a father is unfaithful, he not only wounds the wife, he wounds the children and the, wounds the son. And if the son doesn't deal with it, oftentimes he will repeat that sin. It's just the way mm -hmm. it seems to work. And so uh, we begin, I began helping him forgive his father. And as I was coaching him to forgive his father, he said, and my sister. I said, what did your father do to your sister? Nothing. It's what my sister did to me. Well, let's finish dad. We forgave dad, blessed dad. Let's go back to sis. What did your sister do? Well, from the time I was six or seven to 11 or 12, she not only molested me, but she brought her friends over and they used me like a sex toy. And I said, that kind of explains a lot of what you've been doing. And when he forgave his sister, and then he forgave himself for following that behavior, everything in this man's countenance shifted. Everything changed. And when uh, Tony coached the wife to forgive her husband and some other things in her life, they walked out arm in arm, reconciled. And they have since started uh, two ministries in North Atlanta, one to men with sex addictions and one to uh, couples in crisis. And they're using Forgive Me Forward as their model. But what's also interesting is three weeks later, we get a call. My wife gets a call from Japan and the guy's producer said, I don't know what you did with, but I got a similar. Can we come? And they came from Japan to Atlanta. We coached them. Then they walked out free too. If you choose to forgive, the torment ends. It's the way it works. So the big question becomes why? Why does God discipline unforgiveness this harshly? You make, you make no mistake, this is a discipline. Because I believe unforgiveness is the most harshly disciplined sin we as believers can commit. Because nowhere else does he say, I'm going to hand you over the tortures for it. So why does he reserve that simply for unforgiveness? Because forgiveness is at the core of the gospel. You can't mm -hmm. cut the gospel anywhere it doesn't bleed forgiveness. In Luke 24, it says, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and rise again on the third day. This is the last conversation, if not the last, one of the last that Jesus has with his disciples before he ascends into heaven. He says, thus is written, the Christ should suffer and rise again on the third day so that, and that's a purpose clause. Why is that important? Because with a purpose clause, the main goal is not, be, is not before the purpose clause, it's after the purpose clause. What precedes a purpose clause is the means to the main goal. You do, you do this in order for this to happen. So the death and resurrection of Jesus is a really, really big deal, but it's not the main event. What's the main event? So that repentance for forgiveness of sins be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. Forgiveness is at the core of the gospel. Because the gospel is simply this. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, not only did man lose a lot, but God lost something. We lost a relationship we were designed to have with God, and God lost the glory we were designed to give him. And God said, I want my kids back and my glory back. But there's a problem. There's a sin that it's more than 150,000 years worth of wages. There's zero possibility they can ever make it right. So Jesus, is there something you're willing to do about it? Sure, dad. I have more than enough righteousness in my account. I can cover it. Comes to the planet, lives 33 and a third years perfectly, stretched out his arms. He said, it is finished. He didn't say it's almost done. He said, it is finished. He didn't say, I'll cover the bill. You get the tip. He says it is finished. What was finished? The payment for the sin debt of the world. First John 2, 2 says he, Jesus, is the satisfaction for our sins, but not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. What that means is this. People don't go to hell because they've not been forgiven. They go to hell because they've not repented to receive the benefit of the forgiveness, because every sin ever committed by anybody anywhere on the planet was covered by G, paid for by Jesus on the cross. It's finished. There's nothing left to pay. Three days later, when God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, the Father said, I agree. I received the blood of my son as payment in full for the sins of the world against me. So when we say, God may forgive, but I won't, we're saying, dear Heavenly Father, I appreciate the fact you place such a high value on the blood of your son that you receive it as payment in full for the sins of the world against you you. But what they did to me, what they did to the people I love, I need something more than that. The blood of your son is not enough to satisfy me. And what father would easily handle 
the crowning achievement of his son being devalued by the ones he achieved it for. And we say it this way, the blood of Jesus covers all sin, including the ones that wound me. So long answer to a short question. Bitterness is, is, the, is a result of the tormentors whose God has, the Father has assigned to us to bring us to repentance to, to, for dishonoring the blood of Jesus by not forgiving. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I love also when you when I was thinking about this, you actually call one of your chapters, forgiving people, forgive people. And because I always talk, talk to guys a lot about, you know, hurt people, hurt people. Right. That's just the way it is. That's yep. just it's just an, it's the human nature. And I'm curious when you've worked with so many people around this concept of forgiveness, is it kind of one of the pillars we talk about the lion all the time is health, you know, and I think about going to the gym and getting stronger and you don't just go to the gym and just get on a bench and start benching 250 pounds, right? You would, you would hurt yourself. So is that forgiveness muscle something that has to grow over time? Uh, and how do you see that growing or what, 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 what is, uh, what's your experience with this? Uh, forgiveness is an event. It's not a process. Okay. Uh, forgiveness is not a process. It's a transaction. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a muscle. It's a, it's a choice. Uh, unforgiveness says the blood of Jesus isn't enough. Forgiveness says it was enough. And so it's a transaction. Uh, in the same way, built, buying a house may feel like a process, but it's not. It's a transaction. Uh, a house is purchased in a closing uh, attorney's office. When you sign a paper and, they, they use, and, and, a, and a check, and they sign paper and they give you the deed, right? You give them the check, they give you the deed. That's a transaction. And the deal is done. Now, there was a process of, of getting to that point. I get it and making the choice and all that. But And then there's a process of you know moving into the house afterwards. But forgiveness is a choice. And, and it, I guess to use a muscle is we just need to, we just need to choose ahead of time that we're going to forgive because we believe the blood of Jesus paid for it. Uh, you know, I, I, it's a, forgiveness is applying the blood of Jesus as payment in full for every wound I ever have or will suffer. It's a choice I make to honor the blood of Jesus and apply the blood of Jesus to what happened. Right. And so I, may have to work hard at, at living, learn to live out what it looks like to love my wife, but I love my wife and I'm one with my wife. I don't have to do anything, become one. I'm already one. I, that happened on uh, December 28th, 1979. That happened. So I have to sometimes learn to live out what that looks like in muscle memory. And I have to remember that I forgave sometime on some things, but it's a choice. And I think that's a, that's a fallacy that's out there. I'm going to work my way into forgiveness. I'm going to build it up. I'm going to I'm going to progressively get there and, and eventually I will just over. But our experience is the moment someone chooses forgive, it is transactional and the, the torment leads. We had one guy, his wife called me. Uh, I was pastoring at the time. We were developing Forgiving Forward and, and it, it, we hadn't left the local church to do this yet. And so I was still uh, uh, working through a lot of things in rewriting the book and all that. So, uh, but she calls me, she says, uh, he is in North Atlanta. He saw his dealer and he's high on cocaine in a hotel. What do I do? I said, go home. Just go home and I'll take care of it. So I called him and I said, man, what are you doing? He goes, I'm, I'm pastor, I blew it. Yeah, I heard. So here's what you're going to do. Uh, we go have a mutual friend that's up there close to you. Uh, he's going to where? Are, what, what, what hotel are you in? You know, what a motel, I think is what it was. Uh, and uh, what room? All right. So in a few minutes, James is going to show up to your and knock on your door. You're going to open the door. You're going to hand him your truck keys. Then you're going to close the door and you're going to go to sleep because there's no sense talking to a guy who just shot up with cocaine. Right. So but in the morning, he will he can't go get anything and he'll be he'll be he'll be sober. So we showed up about nine o'clock the next morning. There was three of us. We brought some Chick-fil-A biscuits because he's going to be hungry and some coffee because he's going to need that too. And, uh, and so after we got him fed and I talked him through a lot of things and I coached him to forgive. And he had been wounded. He'd done some really bad things, but he had been wounded some very deep ways too. So we dealt with not only what his root wound was that was causing his behavior, but also his, his sins that he had committed. He had to forgive that. He got radically freed. He got changed right then, there, bam, he's free of cocaine. 
He had one relapse about three weeks later. He called me and I, and I said, you forgot, you forgave, right? Yeah. Remember we did this? Remember this? this? Oh, yeah, Pastor. I forgot. <sighs> Nothing since. I mean, and he was hardcore. Mm-hmm. And uh, what was interesting, that was 2009, 2010 era. And uh, <laughs> uh, in COVID, he calls me and says, Pastor, I can only bring two people to my graduation uh, because of COVID, but besides my wife, and I'm graduating with my doctor in ministry uh, and counseling, and I, I, I want you and Tony to be the two people to come. So it's a choice. Yeah. That is powerful. That is so powerful. Hey, guys, I'm going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Are you ready to unlock your true potential? Introducing 30 Days to Unleash the Lion Within, a revolutionary series that will transform you into the leader God intends you to be. In just 30 days, you embark on a journey of self-discovery and growth. This free resource offers a series of messages each packed with proven methods to simplify and apply God's word to your life. Inside this series, you'll find practical strategies to unleash your leadership potential. You need to learn how to harness the power of God's wisdom and apply it to your everyday decisions. Discover how to lead with integrity, inspire others, and make a lasting impact. But this just isn't another series. It's a transformative experience that will help you find your purpose, ignite your passion, and unleash the lion within. So visit the lion within dot us forward slash unleash to claim your free copy of this series. Don't wait any longer. Visit the lion within dot us forward slash unleash and become the leader God intends you to be. So, so Bruce, I mean, I t- totally get it. It's a choice. I'm just curious, man. Walk through it with us a little bit more because you've talked about learning to forgive, choosing to forgive, then teaching to forgive. And I know you spent a lot of time teaching this this for, forgiving forward process, but I think you probably got a lot of our listeners stirred up now. They're they're on the on the edge of their seats. Okay, give us a little <laughs> bit. Maybe maybe walk through a couple of those those pillars, those protocols of forgiveness, if you would, of what that would look like. Because we may have some guys listening right now who really need to lean into this idea of forgiveness. But it's it's all. You know, we've thrown a lot of scripture at them. We've we've definitely talked about some stories, but hey, can we get practical to to some of these protocols? Yeah, that may put where the rubber meets the road. Absolutely. The the, what I talked earlier was this removes the option, doesn't it? Right. If you see, I'm going to be in torment if I don't forgive. Then, man, I better forgive. I better learn how to do this. Right. Amen. This this moves it from a option to a a necessity. Right. Right. Uh, And so, a couple, a few things before I go to the protocols. Forgiveness doesn't say what they did was okay. Right. It doesn't say, it, it says it was wrong. I mean, we hear things and I'm, I'm horrified by what I hear. And what they did was wrong. hundred percent. Not okay. However, it was paid for. Mm-hmm. Forgiveness doesn't say it was okay. It says it was wrong, but Jesus paid for it in the same way he paid for my sin. Uh, and uh, forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. Uh, that's a real confusion out there. For reconciliation requires two parties. Uh, you, it requires the one who's been wounded to forgive and the one who's done the wounding to repent. Now, repentance doesn't mean change your behavior. It means change your mind, right? It Metanoia, completely change your mind. So what I did was wrong. What can I do to make it right? So mm-hmm. just imagine a high top table with five chairs on it. You got the Father, Son, and the Spirit already sitting there. It's the Father's table. It's a table of reconciliation. If I've been wounded, my ticket to the table is forgiveness. What they did was wrong, but Jesus paid for it. And I come to the table. And then God, the person who did the wounding, says, What I did was wrong. I used to think it was okay. Now I know it was not okay. I was wrong. What can I do to make it right? At ter- at which time this person already sitting at the table says, thank you very much, but Jesus already paid for it. Mm-hmm. So the other part of that, and there's so much teaching. And by the way, guys, you can go to forgivingforward.com. Uh, there is a message on the page. You can see it. There's also a course you can take. Uh, the book you, is there. There's a pro, the, the, the forgiveness guy, which are the protocols. You can download that for you. You can get that for free. Uh, so all that's there. So I'm summarizing about a four-hour teaching, a four-session teaching as we're, we're doing this today. So, uh, But 
Uh, but reconciliation requires the person who's been wounded to forgive this person to repent. And he always calls the person who's been wounded to the table first. Why? Because our forgiveness can't be based upon what this person did. It has to be based on the cross of Jesus. The other reason, if this person's not repentant, and I don't forgive, I'm in torment, and I'm letting someone who's thinking by definition, thinking badly, control whether or not I'm in torment. And there, uh, Chris, there's a theological term for that. It's a deep, technical theological term. It's stupid. All right? It's just dumb. So don't do that. You come to the table first. So that, we, we break that out in our, in our teaching. So it doesn't say it's okay. It was paid for. It's not, we don't forgive people. We forgive wounds. It's a big deal. Where a lot of people get it wrong. I forgive my father. For what? Existing? He's created in the image of God. We're to honor all men. Uh, no, we forgive our dad for what he did. So the, the person, the wounds are associated with a person, but we forgive the person for the wounds. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So I forgive my dad for never showing up at my ball games when he promised he would. I forgive my dad for cheating on my mom, for bailing on the family, for making me feel like I was not good enough, for for, for never being satisfied with my, whatever it is. I forgive my mom for telling me that I would never measure up to anything. You're just like your dad. Whatever these things, whatever the feelings they brought out or whatever, you're forgiving those specific things. All right. Quick summary of, of a couple of sessions there. So how to forgive? What are the protocols? Well, there's, we, we, there, we found seven of them, but there's five that are part of the actually forgiveness piece. The other two, how to deal with memories and how to deal with new wounds. The first one is what we call the, the pro protocol of gratitude. Thank God for forgiving you. We need to remember, Chris, that in the Matthew 18 story, we're the first servant, not the second one. We're the ones who owns the insurmountable debt that God, whatever someone has done to us pales in comparison to the sin we've done against God. We, we violate his holiness in, in ways that no one else could violate our holiness because we don't have them without him. So it, I thank you, God, for forgiving me. That puts us in an attitude of gratitude and a position of humility. Thank you, God, for dying for me. Thank you for paying off for all my sins. The second protocol is we repent of our sin of unforgiveness. Because unforgiveness isn't bad. It's a sin. We, I hope your listeners have, have learned, maybe for the first time, maybe it's just a reiteration of some things they knew before, but that our unforgiveness dishonors the very blood of Jesus that paid for our sin. And mm -hmm. so we repent of that. God, I was wrong to not forgive, and I didn't realize that I was dishonoring your sacrifice for me. I was I was dishonoring your blood, and I do. I, in Hebrews ten says, or we're trampling underfoot the shed blood of Jesus. Right. So we don't want to do that. We're wrong. Sorry, God. Please forgive me. I was wrong to not forgive and dishonor your blood. That's protocol number two. Protocol number three is. Ask God, who do you need to forgive and for what? Here's the, here's the interesting thing. We've coached thousands of people and couples. Th over a thousand couples we've probably coached. Every single time it's happened, it's never not been the case. 100% of the time, the wound that's causing the conflict, that's causing the torment, rather, that's producing the conflict in the relationship predate the couple ever meeting. Mm -hmm. The issue in the marriage is an issue, but it's not the issue. And until right. you deal with the root issue, this issue will always be an issue. But when you deal with this root issue, then you can deal with these things and you can be, you can be good. Because if I've got a wound from my mom uh, and that she was dominant and she was dishonoring to my dad and she was dishonoring to me and didn't give me respect and honor. Uh, and my wife says something cross to me, whose voice am I going to hear? Yeah. Your mom. Yeah. Uh, so, or dad, I mean, the, wh whatever. So we deal with those, then those voices get silenced because it's the, it's the, te the tormentor using those voices and repeating those voices with a, like a, uh, uh, a, a voice in, in, impersonator and sounds like my mom, sounds like my dad, but it's not. It's my, it's the tormentor working, but the moment the tormentor leaves, then we get free. So how do I know where the root wounds are? Well, you can 
dig all you want to, but you won't, you probably won't find it. So how do we find it? We ask the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and Jesus said it's his job to reveal these things to us. And there's a newsflash out there. He's really good at his job. So just listen. And then you Amen. forgive each offense from your heart. Lord, from my heart, I choose to forgive. Name the person for, and you list the offenses. And just listen. Just listen. And, just get, and at some point in time, you'll need to pause and say, Lord, is there anything else? And it's interesting in, in those first moments that those quiet moments after those after those first uh, uh people or, or wounds we forgive and we kind of run out of the obvious and we get quiet it's in those moments that emotions start welling up it's in those moments that the root starts being revealed and it's those moments where freedom starts to happen so we forgive mm-hmm. until the holy spirit says you're done and then you say i i declare this person is no longer in my debt and I transfer their debt to the cross where Jesus paid it all. And then you seal it. Number five is a seal it. And this is where if you cannot do this, you have not forgiven. <laughs> Ask God to okay. bless them and look for ways to bless them when possible. If you cannot bless someone, you have not forgiven them. It was kindness of God that leads us to repentance. While we were still enemies, Christ gave us the, God gave us the greatest blessing of all, the death of his son. And unforgiveness says they need to pay. But true forgiveness is I want them to be blessed because that's how you treated me. So ask God to bless them. And oftentimes you ask him to bless them in a way in which they've been, they, wound, they wounded you. Um, one, one of our one, one real close friend of ours came to me this one time and said, uh, okay, Bruce, I'm not going to, I want to forgive my son-in-law, but I, I, I think I have, but I'm not sure I haven't. I have. I said, what, what, why do you say that? She goes, well, when he comes to the, when he comes to the house, I don't even want to be around him. I said, that's a pretty good clue. You've not forgiven. <laughs> what did he do? Well, a few years ago, he stole some money from us. And uh, he never admitted it. We know he did it. And he's not confessed it. He won't. He, he just won't. Uh, so I'm just, I said, well, have you blessed him? She goes, I, I, I don't know. I said, well, why don't you give him a gift? If he stole from you, give him a gift. Bruce, you don't understand. I don't like him. <laughs> I, I haven't spent enough energy knowing him, so I don't even know what to give him. I don't know what he likes. Then give him some money and just say he can't use it for uh, the the your your daughter or grandkids or any of the household. Just he has to buy something specifically only for him. He says, "I know exactly how much I'll give him. How much? Five hundred bucks." I said, "Can I be your son-in-law?" <laughs> and he, I said, "Why five hundred bucks? Because that's what she's. That's what he stole." And I said. Uh, it's a God, that sounds like a God plan. Well, she did. She went and gave him the money and, and apologized for withholding herself from him and said, we're grateful for what you do, how you are a great husband to our daughter, great father to our grandkids. And we just want to bless you with this. You got to use it. And he just went, huh, thank you. And walked off. No response, no nothing. And I said, I'm looking for a Hallmark movie moment, right? Where there's going to be a breakdown right. of repentance and all that. None of that. And I said, I'm so sorry. She goes, no, no, it's okay, Bruce. It wasn't about him, it was about me. And their whole relationship shifted. So those are the first five protocols. And uh, you, 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 attitude of gratitude, thank God for forgiving me. Repent of your sin of unforgiveness. God, who do I forgive and for what? And what's interesting, Chris, is oftentimes when we're coaching someone, uh, <laughs> when we ask that question, we say, okay, what's the first, after we pray the prayer, what's the first name or face that comes to your mind? So oftentimes, it's not anybody we previously talked about. Really? We'll talk about husband, whatever you else. Uh, my mom. Yeah. Yeah. We hadn't talked about mom, have we? No, but mom is the one. That's the where the root is, and the Holy Spirit brings it up. Wow. Ah, that's a fire hose I just shot at you guys are drinking from. So uh, <laughs> any questions? Well, I'm curious from a, from a guy's standpoint, because, I mean, most of our listeners are Christian men. Of course, I know there are a lot of ladies who listen to the show. So thank you, ladies, for listening. But for the guys out there, those first five protocols, if there's one that is the hardest, particularly for you as you've coached people, particularly men, what would be the hardest one that guys struggle with? I think a lot of guys will struggle with the blessing part. Uh, okay. And and that's because um, we're trained to think they need to pay. Sure. And also, I think one of the one of the um, 
one of the, the distortions about forgiveness out there, particularly any any model of forgiveness that does not involve the cross. Okay, any secular model, and unfortunately, a lot of Christian models are secular models and sacrificed by Christian words. Right? There's always the feeling that if I forgive you, then I'm letting you off the hook, but I'm I'm absorbing it. All right. Mm-hmm. It, there's a debt. Somebody's got to cover this. Somebody's got to absorb this, right? And, uh, and so it feels like it's not fair. It just feels like this. Okay, yeah. And so resentment comes out of that. Okay, I've forgiven, but I'm I'm still I'm still three hundred thousand dollars down on this deal. We actually I coached yeah. a guy, a businessman, who actually went and forgave a guy. And he goes, it was just a small debt. It was like 300000 I'm going, That's you live in a different world than I live in. I get that. But, you know, but, but he had to absorb it, right? So in the natural, that's the way it works. But in the supernatural, it's not that way. We're not saying, I forgive you and I'm paying for it. I'm saying, mm-hmm. I forgive you because Jesus already paid for it. Mm-hmm. I'm realizing that Jesus is going to balance the book. And whatever loss I seem to feel, I've already gained way more than that in the grace that God has poured into my life. And so I'm a, I'm a net positive no matter what anybody does to me because I have Jesus. I have the grace of God flowing in my life. I have the peace of God. And if I forgive, I don't have torment. So yeah. when we get to that blessing, we're going, okay, yeah, well, I can bless because God blessed me and I can bless them because they don't owe me anything because their debt's between them and God. And I, they, I'm, I'm, I've been paid. Uh, it, that's, yeah. that's, I think, uh, I'm not sure if that's exactly the question you asked, but that's, I think, the biggest struggle, that, one of the biggest struggles that we have. Uh, Amen. And just making a choice. I choose to do this. Right. Uh, there's one, one guy named Larry. Um, we're, we're ministering in, in Texas, in Dallas area, and we're, we're teaching. I taught on a Sunday morning. And because it was just a weird anomaly in the schedule, we had Sunday night off and we were teaching the rest of it on, on, on Monday. And so the couple that had introduced us to the church and we actually were staying with them, uh, uh, Jim and Diane, uh, said, we're going to have our small group over. We're the first, they're the first ones who did the video curriculum uh, at their church. And, and they were the bridge that, that their group was the bridge that got us into their church to do the full seminar. And so he said, we just want to spend time with you. We want our, I want our our, our small group to get to know you, you get to know us, no agenda, no teaching, just, just barbecue, just grilling and, 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 uh, sides and all the stuff that people bring and potluck, pot sovereignty, whatever anyone wants to call it, a covered dish dinner. We're going to, we're going to have a good time. That's all we want. We want you to have a day off, a night off, and just, we just want to get to know you and enjoy it. Awesome. I love that food on a grill. I'm in about midday. She, he comes and goes, Bruce, I'm so sorry. Someone invited Larry. And Larry, and I said, that's okay. Why, why, why is that a problem? He goes, you don't understand. Larry's the most bitter man anybody has ever m- met. He, he sucks the life out of every room he walks into with his bitterness. It's, he, he just, I, and I wanted you to have the night off. I didn't want you to have to coach him. I said, look, I'm good. God will lead this, whatever. I'm not, I'm not pushing anything. And my assignment tonight is to get to know your people. So that's my push. All right. So I, don't worry about it. We're good. Larry's good. So Larry shows up with his friend. And uh, Larry, I introduced, he, he get introduced to him, and he goes and sits on the ga- couch. He gets his food, then goes back and sits on the couch, and he just stays on the couch in that place. Everybody else is moving around. Oh, we're talking all this stuff, and the night goes on. And Larry s- sits on the couch, and we're we're just meeting people, and then people start filing out. It's it's time for everybody to go home. Everybody's gone, and now it's just Tony and I, and Diane and to- Diane and Tony, uh, the the house lady, and another lady. So the three of them over there talking about decorating stuff or whatever. And there's Jim and me and Larry still sitting on the couch. So I go sit across from Larry. I say, so Larry, tell me your story. And Jim told me later, he's thinking, don't do that. He'll tell you, you don't want, you don't have the time. So here's Larry's story. Hey, Dr. Bruce, let's take our last break. And then then we'll get right into Larry's story. So we'll be be right back, guys. We have a resource that allows you to test how strong of a Christian leader you are. We designed a short quiz so you can see for yourself how prepared you are for the battle. Don't worry, it's multiple choice and it's a lot of fun. So to access this free resource, visit thelionwithin.us slash quiz. That's thelionwithin.us 
us slash quiz and see if you are ready to unleash the lion within. All right, so Dr. Bruce, you're getting ready to share Larry's story, so let's go. All right, 10 years prior to, our, to, to, to us sitting in that living room, his wife had been seduced. They were attending a large church in the Mid-Cities area of Dallas, Fort Worth, and the pastor had not only seduced his wife, but also his underage daughter. And he was guilty of doing that with other women and other teenage girls. In fact, that, to my knowledge, he's still serving time in Huntsville Prison for what he did with the underage girls. And Larry said, I was on my way to kill him, and God literally stopped me, and I'll never forgive him. In fact, it cost me my marriage. The shame of my wife couldn't handle it, and, 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 and we lo- I lost my marriage. And I said, that's terrible. And I said, Larry, I can't believe someone in my position would do something like that. That's horrific, and, and there's no excuse for that. He said, but there's more, okay? About a year before this conversation, his son, who was a Marine in the Iraq War, had had been decommissioned and come home with PTSD, was really struggling, uh, was supposed to, but he had, at one point, he had a, a negative encounter with a lieutenant with the police department. And uh, he came across that probably because of his PTSD, that there was corruption in the Dallas Police Force. He became a nuisance to the entire Dallas Police Department trying to expose all this stuff, and particularly that one lieutenant. And uh, But he's supposed to be at a Bible study. He calls his buddy at the Bible study and says, I just shot myself. He's in his apartment, in his bathroom, and he's a Marine. He shot himself here. That's not a suicide attempt. That's wow. a cry for help because a Marine would know where to kill him, where to shoot him. This, this, this he knows he's not going to. The buddy hangs up, calls 911, 911, dispatches two uniformed police officers. And this lieutenant who's off duty recognizes the address and says, I'll, I'm nearby, I'll respond. And the lieutenant and the two officers walked in, found this young man bleeding on his own bathroom floor, and they shot him six more times and killed him. And uh, one did not participate, but he didn't say anything afterwards. And they investigated it, and they no-billed it. No, no charge to officers. And Larry said, I'll never forgive the police. Well, I shared with him the Matthew 18 story I talked to earlier. Uh, and he goes, I'm still not going to forgive. And I said, well, Larry, are you enjoying your torment? I said, how's the torment working out for you? I said, mm-hmm. because you, you don't have to forgive, but knock you, you but but why would you not want to why would you want to stay in torment? And I pointed at the bedroom. See that bedroom door? That's where I'm gonna sleep tonight. I'm gonna sleep good because I always sleep well. You haven't slept well in 10 years, have you? No. Why would you want another sleepless night? And he goes, and he finally made the decision, and I coached him to forgive the pastor and his wife, the police officers, and the police department. And everything in his counseling shift, everything changed. Everything changed with Larry. Jim shared later, said, I've never seen anything. I've never seen that kind of a change in someone's appearance. The next night he shows up at the, te- the training and Tony and talks to Tony. Uh, and I'm teaching and, and so um, or I'm talking to somebody else, whatever. And Tony slept up. You need to have Larry tell his story. So Larry, I had Larry at the end share his story. And Larry looked at the pastor of the church and said, before I say anything, is I want to apologize to you for holding you accountable for what somebody else in your position did previously. And it wasn't your fault. And I was wrong. And I'm on your team. I, 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 whatever you need, I'm, I'm with you. And he went around the room to other pastors, said the same thing. He said, today I went to a 7-Eleven. He's a contractor. And he goes, uh, there was a police a cruiser there. And normally I would have just gone to another 7-Eleven, which, Chris, is not a big deal in Dallas. Have you ever been to Dallas? They're every 87 feet. They're everywhere, the 7-Elevens, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he goes, Uh, I didn't. I walked up and I said to the two officers, officers, I want to apologize for you for holding you accountable for what someone in your uniform did. And I want to thank you for the service that you provide to our, our, our city. And if it's okay with you, I want to, I want to buy you some coffee. And now his, his, his whole passion is to support and encourage police officers. So see, when we chose to don't choose to forgive, there's torment. And if you don't like torment, if you don't like your addiction, you don't like your anger issues, you don't like your your bitterness, if you don't like what it's doing inside of you, the simple solution is to choose to forgive it. 
Because the moment you forgive, the tormentors leave. It's 100% of the time. In the same way, the moment someone puts their faith in Jesus, they move from life to, from death to life. The moment you forgive, you move from torment to freedom. It's the way it works. Man, this is powerful stuff, Dr. Bruce. I mean, you've given us so much insight here around forgiveness, torment, uh, the protocols. Guys, you know, be sure to check out the show notes. But before we let you go, I wanted to do a lightning round with you, Dr. Bruce. We call, <laughs> we call it our, our feeding time. So are you willing to, to play a little game with us before we go? Let's, let's do it. All right. So this is this is lightning round. Quick fire back at me to, as fast as you can. So what, what's a, a, a hobby that you have, Dr. Bruce? Wow. Um Spending time with my wife, actually, that's my biggest number one hobby. That's what I do. I just like when we don't do anything, let's just go do something, baby. Let's let's just spend time with her. I, I okay, I, kind of weird, but for people, but that's what I do. I love it. All right. And well, I, what's, your, honest, what's your favorite? Be honest. I just keep jumping here. We, what we do in ministry, I wake up every morning. Really, God, we're the ones you let do this. This is one of the most fulfilling, energizing things that you could ever do. I just love doing what we get to do. Amen. Amen. So maybe not the best. Uh, what, maybe not the best answer because everybody's supposed to have a hobby, and I. But you know that's the way it is. <laughs> that's okay. That's all. Hey, this is your this is your lightning round. We're not worried about the rest of them. So there you go. We'll we'll forgive them. How about that? <laughs> all right, and they can forgive me. All right, and I'll I'll help them. There you go. Help. <laughs> so what's uh what's your favorite food? Uh it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be meat. Uh, either a good brisket or a good steak. All right. Okay. It's got to be uh, the Texas brisket, smoked brisket, off my green egg. Yep. That's what I do. There you go. What's your uh, all time favorite movie? Wow. Let's shift that to old. My favorite production is Les Mis. I love Les Mis. Uh, and there yep. is a movie about that, and it's a fair movie. So I get, but I, you know, but but the, the whole story of Les Mis is is grace and law and the, the 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 way it works. So that's my favorite. But there's so many movies out there. I'm gonna, I love old westerns. Um, uh, sometimes I'll just in the afternoon just go grab a John Wayne movie somewhere. But also like uh, you know the adventure of the Star Wars and all that kind of stuff. Not Star Wars, but okay. the, the Marvel the Marvel stuff and all that. There you go. There you go. Well, what's uh, when you think about God? What's your favorite thing about him? Favorite thing about God uh, is that he is so much bigger than we can imagine, but he stays intimate with us. Mm. He wants to be intimate with us in all of his grandeur, in all the expressions of his attributes, in all of Mm. his self-sufficiency, in all of his not needing of anyone or anything. Mm-hmm. He is sufficient all in of himself with no need. Wants an intimate relationship with me. Amen. And he so let's, let's, paid let's, let's, to make it happen. Absolutely. So let's flip that now on 180. So what's the least favorite thing about Satan? <laughs> I don't like anything about that boy. <laughs> I don't like anything. He's just a, a mean, sadistic dude. So, yeah. But to hear the cool part about Satan, God never fights him. God has never had a fight with Satan. God doesn't fight Satan. He uses him. Right. So, uh, so my favorite thing about Satan is that, that he, he's, he's, he doesn't know how much God uses him, and, and God keeps using him in my life. So, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So when you think about the the last year, Dr. Bruce, what is something that you spent too much time doing? Oh, probably uh, on a screen, either TV or 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 a, a, a iPad. Yeah, probably probably screen okay. time. <laughs> screen time. Uh, what's what's a new habit you want to create, or maybe something that you've recently started? I think I need to uh, I need to get better at. Uh, at at devoting time to writing, to to breaking away and and doing focus writing time. I want to probably set a. I need to probably set a a better schedule for ma- for making that happen. There's a lot of th- writing yeah. I need to do um, uh, that I get just way too distracted with. So I think I've got to get more disciplined in that. I'm yeah. not sure about seeing it. It takes diligence. Writing is writing is definitely a discipline for sure. 
So last question for you, Dr. Bruce, what, what do you hope that the guys remember most from our conversation today? That the blood of Jesus covers all sin, including the ones that wound us, uh, and that your freedom is at the end of forgiveness. Um, our, our passion is to help people experience the freedom of the gospel through the power of forgiveness. And if you don't forgive, it's not because of the guy who wounded you, it's because you haven't forgiven it. And so just embrace the cross. I think that's the one thing about our message that sets us apart from many others is everything is about the cross. So just focus, just elevate the cross. When you elevate the cross, everything else falls in line. It just does. And so take to the cross, forgive it, walk in freedom and live undefendably. Maybe that's that's one thing we didn't talk about. But protocol number seven is make pre-forgiveness a lifestyle. Say I, everything that ever happens to me has already been paid for. So I'm going to walk in freedom. I absolutely love it. Love it. So where do you want them to go, Dr. Bruce? We'll, we'll make sure we sync everything in the show notes, but why don't you tell them one more time where to go to connect with you, with, with your wife, Tony, and, and all the resources you have in Forgiving Forward. Well, ForgivingForward.com, ForgivingForward.com. And there we have a brand new, we just created it and, and released it last September. We had an old one that replaced it. Uh, a video curriculum that teaches a core message of it. It's The production is out, off the chain, but the message is really strong. It's what we teach. Uh, and so it's 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 geared for small groups, for families, couples, any individuals. And then you can access that online or you can actually order the hard copy. Some people still actually have a DVD player. If you want one of those, we got that. And we have the books and that kind of material on there. And if you need coaching, uh, if you feel like, man, I need somebody to help me, because most people do, particularly in the initial stages, give us a call. Uh, we coach, we're training coaches. We're working through that. Uh, in fact, if somebody gets this and wants to learn to be a coach, there's a procedure for doing for that happening uh so you can help other people find freedom through forgiveness so forgivingforward.com the also i'll just throw this in too on the bible app the uh we have a uh a seven day devotional called the freedom of the gospel so uh, okay if, if we want to go through that with a group well, we'll make sure we sync that stuff up in the show notes for you guys so dr bruce this has been a blast having you on anything else you'd like to share today uh just honored to be here and guys just Focus on the cross, focus on Jesus. He's already paid for your stuff. Forgive yourself, forgive others, and walk in freedom. Amen, sir. Well, you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. My blessing, Chris. Thanks for having me on. 